Hello, my name is Kirsten Cook and I'm a graduate student at the Goldman School of Public Policy here at UC Berkeley and I'm here to discuss the importance involving young people in elections. Kirsten, it's just great to have you here in the living room at the Golden School of Public Policy. So you've been very active in trying to mobilize millennials and young people to get active in politics. Tell us a little bit about that. Over the last uh, seven or eight years, I've been working specifically in D.C. to address the major challenges that young people face entering the economy and participating in electoral politics. Uh, my time has been spent with the Roosevelt Institute Campus Network, serving as their deputy director, where we work to empower young people to take an active role in public policy production. We train young people to produce public policy uh, proposals on issues that reflected their values in the communities that they lived on. Uh, I later transitioned to work at the AFL-CIO, where I serve as their Young Worker Program Coordinator, uh, serving the 3.5 million young workers under the age of 35 that are part of the affiliated unions. Uh, in that role, we work to establish new uh, platforms and programs to train and mobilize and educate young workers uh, to not only be active members, but to be activists within their communities and within both the union and non-union space as well as my time at the Center for American Progress, where I work to address a lot of the economic challenges facing young people entering the economy and some of the challenges they have starting businesses and the challenges that women face in the economy as well as, um, um, yeah. So let's talk a little more about wh what are the issues that are confronting millennials, and then I'm gonna move on after that to the questions of what are the, wh what's the problem with millennials? Are they not that active? Is that why we have to mobilize them and so forth? So let's start with the issues. Right. What are the things that millennials should be concerned about? I think the things that millennials are most concerned about are the things that everyday Americans are concerned about, mostly the economy. Uh, in a lot of the work that we've done, we found that most young people are looking for economic stability, not opportunity or growth which means that they're looking for a floor for which to build their economic future on. And right now that just doesn't exist. After the 2008 recession, we saw a record high unemployment for young people. The difficulty of getting a job coupled with the high cost of higher education really compounded a generation into some very serious economic scars that we're working to, co to come through uh, as the economy tends to rebound. The environment is another uh, large issue that a lot of millennials are becoming much more concerned about. There isn't a debate of whether or not global warming exists or who's responsible for it. The debate among millennials is really around what can we do to solve it, what can we do to address the problem so that we can have a stable functioning economy and a world that we can live in. And then mostly that I think a lot of young people are, are kind of turning out for is this violence towards young men and women of color and violence of the police state uh, on, against underrepresented communities. Um, I think the involvement of the Black Lives Matter movement um, is an example of the power that young people have to influence the political process and communicate on issues that are important to them. So there are some issues that millennials have a special interest in, uh, things like higher education, climate change, because they're worried about their futures with respect to the environment. Right. They're worried about whether they can get K through 12 education and higher education that they need. They're worried about whether jobs will be available. Uh, and so is that the reason why you focus on millennials, that there are sort of a unique set of things that they are concerned about? My focus on millennials has really been around the sheer size and scope of it. Um, not only being a member of the generation, but as a cohort, we are the largest group, largest generation in American history. We're the most diverse, we're the most educated, but we're also the most indebted. And we're gonna have to solve a lot of the problems that we see today, many of which were not of our own making, um, but we will be the generation that has to find the answers to income inequality, global climate change, global terrorism, and how do we kind of shift the economy that works for everybody, where we can expand paid family leave or greater protections of union workers across more sectors. Um, so a lot of the challenges that we face are big challenges, and this is the generation that I feel has the opportunity and resources to really address those challenges. So the losses that we face will not be passed on to our children. Is there a worry that this generation is not going to have the same benefits and opportunities that earlier generations had in America? I think that's becoming abundantly clear in just the ability to access higher education. The average student leaves with thirty-four to $35,000 of undergraduate debt. 
This is not the kind of debt that you get when you're buying a home, when you're building equity. This is an anchor on economic mobility and the, even the ability to start a business. So if you are a young undergraduate, you have a bright idea, you want to start a company, you go to get a loan from the bank, your debt to income ratio is going to be horrible. And it's not going to facilitate the kind of access that maybe your generation or my parents' generation had where they can go to college that was affordable and allow that to be a, um, a trampoline, a spring into the middle class where right now it's a real, uh, it's a weight in, on the system. So turning to the second thing, so how does organizing millennials help solve these problems and why are millennials especially an important target for mobilization? Well, it's the largest generation in the nation's history, so having an active role within our country is vital to American democracy um, at, its f at, at the core. I think in terms of involving young people to address all of these larger problems is that we're going to need collective action from millions and millions of people across the country to say the status quo doesn't work and it's time for something different. Um, so I think in terms of why is it important to engage millennials, they are going to be the drivers of the economy in the next 10 to 15 years. They're going to be the ones buying cars and homes. Mm -hmm. If they don't have the money to do so, our economy will stagger. If they're not addressing global climate change, we'll continue to see um, environmental degradation across the country and across the world, which will have substantial impacts on long-term economic growth and, and our individual future. So, so one reason to mobilize millennials is they have a special set of issues that they really need to speak out about. Are millennials very active right now? Is part of the problem that they're not really very active? It depends on how you in, in, in measure uh, activity. I think if you look at the impact of youth movements across the country, mainly around immigration reform with the Dream Defenders, uh, violence of police towards its citizens into Black Lives Matter, these are groups of young people uh, I would guess not many over the age of 35 that are driving a national narrative and forcing major political players to respond to their concerns. So whether or not we can say that they're being involved, that's to be determined. But we are seeing that they are, are having a positive impact in society. In terms of electoral turnout, there's always an opportunity to do better. But a lot of that revolves around a lack of investment and engagement of millennials to be registered, decreasing the barriers for registration and access, making voting easy, and having it be a positive social experience because, it become, because from there it becomes habit. What we want to do is build a habit of young people to participate in their local elections, to participate in federal elections, so they have much greater say in how the country functions moving forward. So is it true that millennials vote at lower rates than middle age and older people? It is true. Uh, in 2014, uh, we saw a 49% turnout in the last presidential, which is down from 51% uh, that we That's saw in 2008. Among millennials. Among millennials in 2008. In 2014, we saw 3.7% of, of eligible Californian uh, millennials turn out to vote, which is absolutely unacceptable. 8.6% or roughly 9% of registered uh, voters turned out for those elections as well. That is abysmal. It's not sustainable. What we need to do is find ways to engage millennials where they are and address a lot of the challenges they have. A lot of millennials move frequently. So we're going to have to find ways for them to update the voter registration mm -hmm. that's easy and effective for them to do so. We need to communicate where, to them where they are in the country. Not a lot of millennials are buying uh, cable packages like our parents used to be, so a lot of that will be through mobile access, online engagement, and through text messaging programs. Um, and most importantly, it r really involves on the ground people communicate with, communicating with millennials, talking to them about their issues, advocating about the values that they want to see in the, in the world and in the workplace, and then giving them access and information. To so tell us specifically about something that you think works with millennials. Exactly what would somebody do in a local area if they wanted to engage and get involved, a bunch of young people? I think they should speak directly to their issues. Um, they should communicate with them as their adults and not treat them as young people um, and speak down to them. I think the most important thing is to find young activists who are leaders on those issues and bring them a part of your conversation. Have them at the table, the decision making process, the communication process as to what's important to them, why is it important to them, and how we can get more young people to participate in, this, in these issues. Young people care about all the issues that older adults uh, older Americans are dealing with every day. We just don't always have a voice at the table. Those who provide us a voice and access will benefit from our involvement. So tell me about Bernie Sanders and young people. It's been noted repeatedly that a lot of young people are voting for Bernie Sanders. What, what, what's the chemistry there? What's working for him? 
I think he's speaking a lot about the issues that matter to them. I, th I think a lot of young people look at the economy and see it as a rigged system, and he's saying that out loud. Um, he's also allowing young people, when they are taking direct action, to have a voice in this process. So the great example of two young women that interrupted Bernie Sanders at a rally to speak about Black Lives Matter and anti-police violence, he didn't shut them down or cut them off. He gave them an opportunity to speak and a space to, to communicate with. He's also talking about the importance of free higher education, which, you know, for a lot of people, higher education is a right. He's talking about access to free health care, which a lot of people feel health care is a right. And so what you're seeing is the power of values-based messaging on important issues that reflect the values of a generation. And I think the disconnect that we're seeing from uh, Bernie Sanders and other candidates is that they're not communicating on those values, they're not communicating on those issues, uh, and they're not involving young people actively uh, within those campaigns. Um, you know, the, the, the benefit to the Democratic Party is that in a recent Rock, Rock the Vote poll, they found that 63, around 60 percent of those supporters who are supporting Bernie right now will come to support Hillary. If you look at the projections between Hillary, the presumptive Democratic nominee and, and Hillary Clinton, the presumptive Republican nominee and Donald Trump, Hillary will have a, a vast majority of, of millennial votes as well. So how important is it to, f to focus on millennials right now to give them this leg up? Is, th is this just some, I, mean, why, I guess what I'm really asking is, why did you get involved in this? Why do you care so much? I mean, obviously you're a millennial, so that's maybe right. part of the answer, but, but what are some of the other reasons? Well, during the Kerry Edwards campaign, I was very involved working in Washington State, and what I realized is that a lot of elected officials and higher-ups wanted my energy and my body to go out there and knock on doors and pound pavement, but they didn't care about my ideas. They didn't care about my voice or what my perspective was in solving problems. Um, that really bothered me um, because I was deeply committed to the democratic process. I'm deeply committed to making the country better. But if someone wants me to participate but they don't care about my voice or my values, then there's not much uh, reason for me to continue to participate. And from there on, I just felt that the challenges that faced my generation were so substantial that it was important for me to work on them, and who better to be a voice than other young people on important p issues than people who are most affected by them. So what do you say to young people who come back with, ah, the system, it's rigged, it, you can't change it, it's really not worth all this effort, why are we bothering? I think the important issue for young people and for people across the country that feel that way is that when you fail to participate, then someone's making a decision for you. I don't think that most young people would approve of other people making decisions for them on the issues that matter. Mm -hmm. Higher education, jobs, workplace safety, uh, in the environment, immigration reform, LGBT equity. I think there's a, a serious values and policy gap between older generations of where the country the young, that young people would like to see. And if they are okay with other people making those decisions for them, then they should sit down and not participate. But I would challenge them to say that if you want an active role in the country, if you want a country that serves your needs and your values, then the most important thing for you to do, at the very least, is to cast a ballot. But more importantly, is continue civic engagement, not just on Election Day, but throughout the course of their lives. Well, that leads us to public policy. Why a public policy school? This is a place where we learn to analyze policy and think of better policies. Right. You've been very involved in organizing millennials. Why public policy? I always felt that social change was kind of a, a pyramid of action. The first being grassroots advocacy. Can you get people within a community um, engaged on a particular issue that shares their values and they want to see change? The second element after that is electoral politics. What are we doing to engage you know, candidates that reflect our values, that can communicate on issues that are important to us, um, that are going to win on election day so we can go ahead and implement those laws? And the third pillar is really public policy. What is a long-term sustained change that we want to institute that will help address issues over the long term? And really the combination of all three is really where my heart lies. As an organizer by trade and profession, I've come to public policy seeing that just voting in the right candidate on election day isn't the solution to any one problem. Just as just advocating doing grassroots organizing without electoral politics or sound public policy is not going to have the lasting sustainable change that we want. It's a combination of all three that allows us to And kind public of policy that. adds what specifically to that formula? It's, I, for me, it's the, it's the bridge from instantaneous, we want to change this bill or this issue to long-term systemic change on a number of issues. So, you know, if we want to deal with uh, 
environmental issues, then cap and trade is one option. But there are also a number of options that will help us address these issues. And they could be as local as um, making sure that fracking water is not being, uh, is being contained in a way that's not polluting local groundwater of community members to the overall global climate change process. Public policy is the bridge between grassroots advocacy and electoral politics so it's and institutes it. formulating the solutions and making sure that whatever is being proposed will actually do the job. Exactly. What can we do to solve long-term problems in a way that will have an impact, well, ideally a positive impact on the lives of people we're trying to address? And public policy allows you that opportunity to do that. So what's the one, one big thing you've learned from the public policy school? What would you say has changed the way you think about what you do? I think it's just provided a, a completely different lens to how I look and perceive problems in the world. You know, as an organizer, I'm always about trying to build community at a great enough volume and scale to uh, exceed that of what my opposition is. Mm -hmm. Today, I can look at public policy and say, maybe that might be a feel-good solution to this one issue, but that's not going to address that problem. I can say, this is the real problem, and this is how we solve it. And it may require electoral politics, it may require grassroots organizing, but now I can really focus, deconstruct a problem, find the root of what that issue is, and begin to solve that directly. And indeed, one of the things we teach our students is the first step is define the problem, because often the definition that's out there is not the right definition. And right. in fact, when you look deeper, there's other things going on, and you really have to broaden what you're thinking about to make sure you really do solve the problem and not just actually make it even worse. Exactly. I, you know, I think about voting ID laws. If we were talking about young people and voting. A lot of voting ID laws are designed not to help facilitate uh, people participating, but to curb uh, voter, um, voter impersonation or, or people uh, voter fraud. And in reality, that's not a problem. We could do the analysis to see what the real issue is in terms of voter mm -hmm. fraud. We can do the analysis to see what the real challenges are in ensuring that the right person is casting a ballot. But really what, what has been passed across the country has been uh, oppressive voting laws that have disenfranchised young people versus enfranchised young people. To take the policy lens, to look at that, to examine that, to say, one, this is an issue, this is what the real issue is, we should spend our time trying to make democracy easier to access and more conducive for young people to participate. So make sure you actually focus on the real problem and not on ones that are just political symbols, but not really the problem. Exactly. Well, thank you, Kirsten Cook, for discussing. My pleasure. Your career. Thank you.